So, hey, everybody. I know some of you guys were on and left, but that's okay. You'll come back with the replay. We're, we're good. You're going to see an amazing show. And this is Mr. J, the relationship coach. And I'm super happy that he's with us tonight. He's going to tell us some amazing things that you all may not have heard, but actually went through and didn't know it. So if he doesn't mind, I'd love for you to tell us about your background. Uh, well, uh, such as uh, my coaching background, my childhood, my faith background, my marriage background. I, I'd love for you to give us an idea of kind of your coaching background and mix in a little bit about your faith. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, I uh, started coaching years ago before coaching was even cool. Um, I started with uh, my bachelor's degree in psychology and uh, started kind of coaching like marriage and premarital counseling in, uh, in church that, uh, uh, with a bachelor's degree in church and religious uh, institutions and so forth. Um, and I was coaching on and off uh, doing what's called intrapersonal relationship coaching, which is helping people with the relationship they have with themselves. Because I always say the relationship with yourself sets the tone and standard for all other relationships around you. Um, and I was doing that on and off um, for a while, um, pulled out of it just for a little while to stay home with my kids for a couple of years. And uh, when I got back into it, I uh, looked into uh, some, some trauma coaching but more specifically betrayal trauma coaching because betrayal trauma is, is a world different from trauma itself. Um, and uh, so long story short, I was watching a uh, TEDx talk one time. I emailed the person who gave the TEDx talk and uh, she invited me on her membership only community um, where, where, where everybody there dealt with betrayal trauma. And after I was on it for a few months, I told her that I really loved what she was doing. And she said, would you want to go through the certification to become a coach? And I said, absolutely. So I went through the certification to become certified as a betrayal trauma well, practitioner um, because of my background practitioner. And, um, and so that's what I've been doing now primarily. I still get calls for all kinds of reasons, you know, whether it's life coaching, coaching in general, intrapersonal relationship coaching, but I really see that there's a need out there for betrayal trauma coaching. And, um, and that's kind of specifically what I do now. Okay, I think that's amazing. And everybody's been kind of shooting me messages. What, what are you talking about? Eleanor? what? Betrayal trauma? And I'm like, we gotta wait till Friday. No. So can you specifically tell us what betrayal trauma is? Yeah, so, um, so uh, we've all had trauma in our life. We've all had trauma, whether it's the little T trauma, the big T trauma, we've all had trauma in our life. And we've all had experienced betrayal in our life, whether it's the little B or the big B. Um, nobody's exempt from trauma. Nobody's exempt from betrayal. I don't care if you're 12 and you got your heart broken by your first love. We've all experienced betrayal and trauma and yada, yada. But the difference between betrayal trauma is that it has a personal feel. You are, you, you, you know, if you lose a loved one, um, it's traumatic. It's, it's profoundly traumatic. Um, but you know they didn't specifically pass away to hurt you or that yeah. to intentionally hurt you. When somebody betrays you, uh, there's a feeling of intentionality. Um, and you just feel like, well, you knew when you were going to do this, it was going to hurt me. That's a betrayal. And the more profound the betrayal, the more close the relationship, the more you relied on someone. So, for instance, you can go through betrayal trauma with your boss. Um, mm. but it's not going to be the same as betrayal trauma with a parent, a child, yeah. or your significant other especially if you're financially dependent on that person or you're emotionally relying on that person or what have you. So the more you are invested in relying on the individual, the more profound the trauma is going to be. And that's betrayal trauma. Now, keep in mind, you can be betrayed by a significant other, your boss, your parent, your child, your neighbor, your best friend. We can even be, have betrayal trauma from ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. How many times, you know, do we, do you hear from people, you know, I ate right and I did yoga and I did meditation and I ran every day and I did my, you know, my smoothies and yada, yada, and I still wound up with breast cancer. 
you know, it feels like a betrayal to themselves or a bit, you know, or maybe their creator or the universe betrayed them. So betrayal trauma can come in any form. But again, it's on the spectrum, depending on who it is, the amount of time you have with that person, how reliant upon. Um, and it adds so much complexity. One of the um, layers, uh, and, and interrupt me and stop me at any point, you want me to stop blabbing. One of the complexities um, that it adds is what's called the Red Riding Hood's Red Riding Hood syndrome, also known as betrayal blindness. You know, in the Red Riding Hood story, um, Red Riding Hood so desperately wanted to see her grandmother. She just wanted to go visit her grandmother. She made her baked goods and she went through the scary forest. She did. She she did. Went go, <laughs> she went to go see her grandmother. Now, when she walked into her grandmother's house, you cannot tell me that something in her gut told me, I better turn it on and run. But yet she didn't. And the reason she didn't is because she wanted to believe the scary wolf sitting in bed, even though she said, you have big eyes, you have sharp teeth. Yeah. <laughs> grandmother. But you know what? She didn't follow her gut instinct. And what wound up happening? She died. She got eaten to death. So what happens so many times is that we're in relationship uh, with, with whomever, and we feel something in our gut that's off. But what happens is that uh, we, we tend to be blind to it. And this almost happens on a subconscious level. And this is the reason why, believe it or not, it's our body trying to protect us because our body knows if we get the truth out of what we're feeling, it might be too much trauma for us. So our body almost suppresses or represses it until we're ready to face the truth, which maybe we then have the tools or the resources or the knowledge or the wherewithal to deal with it. But what happens is after actually, you know, we see the light or the truth comes out or we find those secret numbers under the mattress or see the phone calls or the phone bills, then what happens is we're not only um, devastated by the other person, we're also devastated by ourselves because we, we traumatize ourselves by not following our gut instinct. We, we, you know, go ahead. Oh, I don't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. I was just having this conversation with someone about how they were feeling, and they were saying that they didn't feel good and their head was hurting, and just all these little ailments. And I finally kind of, after they got it out, I stopped them and I said, You're trying to do the same stuff over and over again, and then you're wondering why you feel the way you feel. Your body's trying to tell you what steps you're taking in your life aren't working. So you're getting headaches. You're having, you know, panic attacks. You, you, you can't figure out what decision to make because your body's trying to tell you you're making the same old wrong decisions. And so, um, that, that want people to think about what you're saying, because it, it does take us to be ready to accept the trauma that comes with what's going to go with the betrayal. But also, we need to see the signs when they're there, when we're not feeling well, when we are resistant to something. We know there's a reason, and we choose to ignore that. So is that part of betrayal blindness? That is complete betrayal blindness, is that we are so desperately trying to hold on to what we want that we, can, that we stay blind to what is real. Um, but you know, sometimes I'm talking to people, and I just want to sing that song from The Color Purple. God is trying to tell you something, or maybe God is, you know. But but again, <laughs> depending on uh, depending on the situation you're in, maybe you're so financially reliant on someone that you choose to. I mean, I listen. I've talked to people who, you know, one of their parents were, you know, not to get graphic, but down their pants. And another parent walked in the room, saw it, turned around and walked out and shut the door. They did not want to, they did not want to, to deal with that. You know, um, mm -hmm. if you are, if, depending on your um, childhood, your attachment style, your situation, your circumstances, sometimes you, 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 you just completely are closed off to that reality of any possibility. Um, and that is betrayal blindness. And then what, and then that makes your healing journey that much more difficult because not only are you getting over the betrayal of the person who hurt you, you're also going through the hopelessness, the despair, and the, um, and the, uh, the disappointment that you didn't trust your intuition. You didn't tap into your gut. You didn't listen to yourself. But as well, you, let me, go ahead. I was just going to say, as you know, the more you heal, 
the more you get to, to, to the, all that healing goodness, you start realizing those red flags are not red flags. They're deal breakers. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I totally agree with that. The, uh, what, what was I going to ask? I was going to ask really quickly when, like you're saying, when the, when you see these deal breakers or the red flags and we know sometimes, I, sometimes I think, and maybe you can explain it better. What I'm trying to say is let's, we'll use me as an example. When my husband passed and my son passed and I went to my mother and I, I flat out said to her, I needed her. And she said, well, my mother passed a month ago. I can't help you. Should, knowing my mother, and I knew who she was, and I knew she was a hardcore chick. Why did I expect that that would be different? And then, yes, I still felt betrayed because I thought, really? This time she couldn't give it? Do we sometimes expect not, not to have betrayal when we know we've had it the whole time? You know something? A few things. Um, a, we do have a um, a self fulfilling prophecy sometimes, or what some people would call self sabotaging, or what some people would call confirmation bias, um, where subconsciously it's like, you know what? My mother is probably going to do this, um, but let me just see if she's going to do it. And so, okay, yeah. So that's that's a a possibility. Another possibility is our hope. I mean, my gosh, people have so much hope. So when you're in a time of despair, we have so much hope. Like, you know what? I'm hoping this time's going to be different. I'm going to go to them and I'm hoping this time's going to be different. Another thing too, though, as you know, sometimes your brain is hijacked. Your brain is hijacked. Your brain is hijacked uh, when you're on both sides of the fence, whether you're an addict who's doing some betraying, your brain gets hijacked. Whether you're betrayed, your brain is hijacked. And there might have been a part of you that maybe, you know, your frontal cortex, that part that's logical, maybe a part of that was hijacked temporarily when you went to your mother. So I think it was. So there different ex explanations for why we went to our mother. Maybe, and you know something? Maybe there was a part of you that reverted back to your childhood, that little girl that needed her mother, and you wanted to prove to yourself would my mother, when push came to shove, would she be there? Would, that, would my mother be there for that little girl that she wasn't when I was younger? And unfortunately, she proved that she couldn't be. Yeah. And I, and, and I want people to know, sorry, I don't, I don't hold anything against that. I think yeah. everything you just said is what I knew, all those yeah. different layers within. But my mind, I do think it was little, because had I not been in that crisis, so to speak, of losing my family, I don't think... Eleanor, who's in her normal right mind, would have even went because Eleanor knows Mary's not going to do anything. She loves me, yes. but she's not going to do anything. So that, I do believe my mind was kind of like, you got to get some help from somebody. And everybody kept talking about their moms and their moms would help them. And I thought just this once, she's going to come through. And that didn't happen. So what I want to throw in real quick, what do you consider crucial to understanding when someone has had their trauma betrayed. Um, okay, let me just say first and foremost, and I'm gonna just use what you just said. Um, be very careful who you share your experience with. Because I'm gonna tell you something. I don't care if you're going through devastating betrayal trauma or you just won the lottery. The first thing you wanna do is get on the phone with your friends. Oh my God. I just found a prostitute's number in my phone or, oh my gosh, girl, I just want a million bucks. And the first thing we want to do is, you know, instead of going to the throne, we like to pick up the phone and that's where our problems come in. So the first thing I want to do is say very careful who you share your experiences with. That's number one. Now, number two, I just want to say this. Oftentimes we share something with, with people and that gives us betrayal itself. Now you've added betrayal on top of betrayal, and you're going to have to work through all of this stuff. It just becomes more complex. But I do want to say this, just to give people the benefit of the doubt, some play, bit, you know, play devil's advocate. Sometimes your emotional tank is, let's just say, 10 gallons. And the person that you're talking to, their emotional tank is two gallons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can, they can completely give you every drop of emotional gas they have, which, which is wonderful. They're giving you everything they got. 
but it only filled up your tank two gallons. You have ten gallon tank, so yeah. you're still you're still almost running on empty. But they've given everything, so we got to understand. Who, you know, who, who take that into consideration when you're talking to people, they may not have the emotional wherewithal, capacity, understanding, wisdom. And you know something? Maybe God bless them because, you know, some people that only have that type of wisdom have been through the school of hard knocks and done the healing work to get through it. So you can't really, you know, blame for the most part. Some people just keep that in mind or, you know, for the people that are watching, uh, you know, when you share something with somebody, be very careful. Um, and number two, understand that trauma, betrayal trauma is, you know, everybody explains it differently. It's 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 a it's like a negative fireball placed inside you. And really, it's just going to keep burning until it gets dealt with and what one of the things you have to understand is time time doesn't matter time doesn't matter somebody could go through trauma today and 15 years later have a trigger and they're still back to that day one hour one where they got that phone call so, so many times people like to say, oh my God, it's been five years. Get over it. Get a life. Time don't mean Jack. I'm sorry. You know, um, um, you know, I, I, I tell people this sometimes. Imagine, imagine a box with a big ball and a red button. And imagine that ball moving around the box. It's going to hit that button a lot of times. And that button... That buttons uh, immediately triggers our our sympathetic F -f fight or flight, you know, yada, or freeze or fawn or whatever the f's you wanna you know use for this. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is that with time and with healing and with the proper tools, that ball starts to shrink a little. So when it bounces around, it's going to hit that trigger less, but still, when it hits that trigger, that trigger sets off the trigger. Yeah. Now, so 15 years later, you might have a tiny marble bouncing around that ball. So hours, days, weeks might go by and it doesn't hit that trigger. But all of a sudden, you're whistling Dixie doing dishes that hits the trigger and you fall to your knee. You so do. <laughs> I love I love that example because um, when my uh, my dad passed about three, four years ago, and I remember they were showing videos in the living room with my mom and the family and my kids and my husband and stuff was on there. And probably in the past, because this is, you know, I'm close to 15 years in as a widow and all that, I would have been a totally different basket case. So I'm a classic example of that ball being smaller. But I also have a better control when I am triggered. I knew that was going to trigger me. I knew I would not be able to handle it. Rather than stand there and turn into a gushing ball, I decided I know what they look like. I appreciate my mom, including everything, including them. And I chose to go into the kitchen and go outside for a little while. And I remember I heard my niece say, she's always trying to make it about her. And I thought, this is another example of, in my opinion, betrayal of someone's trauma because how dare you? That's a lot of work. And you know that and I know that to be able to say, those pictures are going to trigger me. I'm going to walk out of the room quietly. Nobody knew I was gone and just step outside and let them enjoy the video without me turning into a blubbering nothing. So people don't watch what they say or think about all the work that has gone into you being able to walk out of that room. And so definitely I agree that uh, we have to be careful who we talk to. It's, it's like I, I don't have any choice. She was my niece. She would have known what would have happened anyway. But to disrespect what someone has gone through it's like wow that shows the level of where you are and nothing has hit you really to traumatize you to that level so can you kind of give us in one word what trauma betrayal is like <laughs> no i can't <laughs> okay okay uh no listen um listen if 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 be when you discover betrayal, 
It is like somebody takes a raw hunting knife oh. and guts your stomach. That's good. And all the contents of your existence falls out. That's you good. Are, you are you are zombified. You're in a fog. Your brain is hijacked. You're you're on guard. This is how I, I explain to people. Imagine. Imagine you have two young kids, right? Two babies. Mm -hmm. and imagine that you are um, on a bridge a mile above uh, land. And you're on a, a bridge that's a mile long. And under the bridge is fire and lava. Mm -hmm. and you got both your babies in your arms, one on this arm, one on this arm. And you have to go across the bridge to safety, right? Now, who's leading you? is the person you trust the most in life. That's who's mm -hmm. leading you. So you got your baby in your arm and you're trusting the person in front of you is gonna lead you to the other side of this bridge a mile above land with mm -hmm. lava and fire under it. And you're wow. walking with your two babies and all of a sudden the bridge starts to move a little. And you're like, what's going on? What in the world's going on? That's betrayal blindness, but we won't, but whatever. What's going on? What's going on? All of a sudden, the bridge collapses. You got your two babies in your hand. You're falling into fire. You're looking Ooh. around, grabbing onto anything that possible <laughs> to save yourself and save your babies. You're not yeah. thinking of anything but purely survival. I need to breathe, and I need to grasp onto something. And you grasp onto something just to look up, and the person that you are following that you trusted the most has a hammer in their hand. They were the one that destroyed the bridge. You are wow. all screwed up. That's the beginning of betrayal trauma. I, I love that. That is an amazing visual because it's so beyond what people can understand. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're standing there and you have no recourse because there's nobody to reach around. This is a person, like you said, you trust the most. There's no one to reach around. There's no one to reach under. You have told them everything. You have given them everything and that's where we have to kind of really truly start to understand how much should we share because people will come back and destroy you with what your trauma was like you have any you know you don't have control of how the trauma happened but they'll come back and destroy you with your very own trauma so um hey guys that are on here i'm, I'm not ignoring you guys how are you guys doing and just understand that this is real. I used to kind of think it was like a tornado, but then I was like, no, it's worse than a Category 5 tornado. I mean, you really don't know what to do, and it's, it's then you don't know who to trust. It's a really crazy, messed up space to be in, and then people are like, well, why didn't you talk to me, or why didn't you come to me? And I'm going to say this with truth. I'm a faith believer. I know you have faith. Pastors, bishops, preachers, ministers, whatever you want to call yourself, they will betray you too. So you very much have to understand, you have to be careful of who you're relaying how much information to. So what have you encountered personally that helps you relate to those in need of help in this area? Um, okay, first, let me just say this. Let me just say this, what you just said about the pastor. I will say this, there's, there's no substitute for experience. There's no substitute for experience. You know, somebody can... You know, you can sit there and tell somebody your story and they can do all the nodding of the heads and, you know, maybe even the glossy eyes and they feel you yeah. and they're sympathetic and sympathetic and all this jazz. But man, until you're telling your story to somebody who's been through in your shoes, that that conversation is on a different level. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> um, and um, so, so, yeah, absolutely is... is uh, the, you got to be careful who you tell, especially, especially if it's in a couple situation and you decide to reconcile. Oh, oh yeah. Now you got all kinds of voices trying to tear you apart. So. And that's a danger zone when you've told too much and you go to fix that. Oh, that's that's very dangerous. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. And and just real quickly uh, to go back to to your niece, one of the things that and I've said this before one of the things that, you know, if I were in the living room or wherever with your niece, one of the things that I would have said is, um, you know something, it's, it, you don't understand why your aunt got up and walked away. And I hope you count your blessings that you don't understand. 
Yeah. And I think, uh, I, I think my, one of my sisters, well, uh, not her mom, I think my other, my other sister may have said something and somebody kind of walked out and talked to me for a little bit. And I said, I, I truly wasn't upset. I didn't want to get upset. I said, my mom has a right to look at my dad, to look at her grandchildren, to look at everybody that was in those pictures because she needed that for herself that particular day. She needed to feel happy about her family. So I'm not going to take that away from my mother, but I'm not going to sit and turn into a blubbering mess where I may not get off the floor the next day. I had just lost my father and, you know, going back into thinking about losing my husband and a child and, and the whole funeral. I don't know what was wrong with her. Uh, she just came at me. She talked about me outside. She talked about my children. She talked about a lot of stuff. Now, mind you, this was one of my favorite nieces that used to babysit for me. Loved her to death. She was sweet as pie growing up. Um, she had some trauma happen to her from her step parent. And I don't know what it was, but that whole weekend I had to stay away from her because it was just conflict. And so to this day, and it's, it's, I don't think you have to cut people off. I could care less about that stuff. I don't deal with her because whatever you have wrapped up in your anger, I didn't get. And so for me, you know, people have to understand that too. I'm not going to chase her down to understand what the issue is because the things that you said were so ugly. Why would I? I think we've got to stop giving people closure and chances. If you get that ugly with someone who's lost literally their whole family in minutes, why should I? Yeah. Because that, that was a huge betrayal. Yeah. And I thought, wow, what's, what's wrong with this girl? And that's what, to this day, I'm like, what's wrong with her? And so, you know, I remember she walked up to me and said, this was so crazy because people may have had this happen. Funerals bring out really weird stuff, I've learned. And I remember she said to me, I'll fight you outside. No. I was literally floored. I'm like, what's wrong with you? I walked away. I, to this day, I never know what that was about. And uh, it was just very strange. So sometimes we, I don't know what, we don't know what's going on in people's heads or why they act the way they act. So, I mean, like you said, if someone doesn't know what you've gone through, they can't really relate when you're talking to them. So, I, you know, I, 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 I'm glad that you can relate when people are coming to you it, with this with this type of need do you think that faith helps people with their relationships or their trauma related issues okay so let me just say this um this is what's <clears throat> interesting oftentimes people do go to uh their pastors their uh reverends their religious leaders um um, and you're right, sometimes they actually can hurt you or traumatize you deeper. But here's what's interesting. Some people, and, and again, there's everybody that's on the faith spectrum. There's some that are, you know, the religious zealots or whatever. And then there's some agnostics and then there's, or atheists. And then there's one in between, you know, some people after betrayal or after trauma, they cling to their faith. They cling to their faith like nothing else because not only did the person I love and trusted the most betray me, which is profoundly disturbing and, and you don't understand, but you also, uh, you also can't even trust yourself at that time because that's the time maybe your body is telling you, I tried to tell you, I tried to show you signs, I tried to raise the red flags, you ignored them. So now you can't even trust yourself with your judgment. On top of the fact that you're thinking, wait a minute, I picked this person, I chose this person, and this is what they did? My picker's off. I can't rely on myself. So some people go to their faith and cling on to it like never before. Other people start blaming God and accusing God, God, I prayed for this relationship. God, I trusted you were going to find my AB. God, you told me this was the person to marry. And now yeah. this happened, I'm done with you, God. So really, <laughs> it could go either way. Um, you know, and you got to be very careful. Um, uh, you know, first of all, I, I don't talk to people on a faith level unless they come to me on a faith level. I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, now that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that when people come to me, um, I don't sprinkle a little bit of you know 
faith here and there or spirituality or whatever. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. But I, but I just salt the seed. I just use it for seasoning. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> because that can take somebody off. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and people don't get that. It's like you should be Christian based or faith based or whatever. It's not, it's, this has nothing to do with money, and I'm sure you agree. This has to do with you're missing out on helping whoever needs help. To me, it's like if someone really needs help and all I have plastered all over is that I'm faith based, and I know, and they feel like, oh, her program or her coaching can help me. Then they're like, well, I guess I'll go to somebody else. And then they don't really get the help that they need. To me, I think about that. That's devastating because it's like, you should be able to help whoever you can help. If, like you said, they come to me with the faith piece, we're on it. Yeah. And that's great. And I do, I sprinkle it in as well, but I don't think I have to literally say this is all that I do. So people have to understand that, like you said, it can go either way. I was mad at God for a long time. I was like at the okay corral with God. It was like, you know what? We, we, we gonna meet up at dawn. I mean, I was just so mad. <laughs> and so it took me some years to, to get away from that thought process that why did you do this? So what are three things that you feel can help someone who's experienced this type of trauma? Okay, well, um, uh, that's a very, very good question. And it's a loaded question because, um, first of all, I would want to know where on the spectrum this person is. Is this person still in the bear hugging the toilet vomiting stage, which is oh. the I just found out? Or is this person 25 years out and they just, something's holding them back from being completely authentic and happy? But one of the things that I would um, say is number one is is do what you can to to truly truly get to know yourself. Really get to know yourself because you know I tell everybody this all the time. You're a different person today than you were five years ago. You're going to be a different person five years from now than you are today. We're not necessarily human beings. We're human evolvements. We're changing. <laughs> we're growing. So get to know that new person, um, you know, who you are. That's number one. Number two, one of the things that, um, especially with betrayal trauma, so many times somebody has um, a current new trauma, but really 90% of it is the effects of the original trauma. So one of the things that I do is, um, is go back to your original trauma and let's try to deal with that original trauma because so many times just through association we add on so much more suffering onto our current trauma because we associate it with our unhealed trauma from our past especially for those of us who came from a, a, a non-secure attachment from a child whether you have a um and I, uh, you know uh you know go too much into this but um um a non-secure attachment a fearful avoidant attachment or let's just say the trauma also um completely pulverizes your love language i mean there's just so many things to get to know about yourself to help your healing journey so one of the things i tell people to do is write your younger self a letter just write your younger self a letter and be very real and raw and honest go to a time when you were younger where something happened um because we all had things happen in our childhood Go to a time in your childhood and write yourself a letter and, 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 and tell yourself, you know what? I was there when A, B, and C happened. I was there, but I couldn't do anything. And I know you didn't have a voice and I couldn't have a voice for you, but you know what? I, I got your back now. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm never going to let that happen to you again. Write yourself that letter and let you know that you got your own back. And the key thing with that though, is write it with your non-dominant hand. And the reason for this is because everybody has a filter. No, I know. Everybody's looking at me like, are you serious? It's chicken script. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's the deal. Everybody has a filter. We all have a filter. I'm talking to you right now with my coach filter. If I go talk to my spouse, I'm going to be talking with my spouse filter. If I go up to my parents, I'm going to be talking to them with my child filter. We all come with a certain presentation. It's a filter. But so our hand does the same thing. When we write with our dominant hand, our mind is so in tune with that, it filters out certain things. But when you write with your non-dominant hand, there's no filters. You get real and raw. And keep in mind, nobody's going to read this letter but you. And nine times out of ten, you might not even read it. It's just so it goes from your head to the paper. 
No, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you want to read that, you can. But really, it's just to go from your head to the paper uh, as a cathartic process. So that's number one. Number two, if somebody experiences betrayal trauma, have what I call a lifeline list. So um, what are, write down, what are three people I can call in the middle of the night um, if I can't sleep and I, and I just need somebody to talk to and I'm having a panic attack? Write down three people of faith. If I need to call somebody, they're going to pray with me and, and not be not judgmental. Uh, name three people that I can call at a moment's notice that will come and babysit my kids so I can go get in my car and punch my steering wheel and scream at the top of my lungs. Name three people, you know, uh, name three restaurants that, I, that have DoorDash that will deliver because on those days where I'm in bed in the fetal position and I can't make dinner for my kids, I got to pick up the phone and have DoorDash come or whatever, you know, people. So have a lifeline list because what happens is that when we get triggered, our mind is hijacked. We can't sit there with our frontal cortex and say, let's see, am I in the mood for Arby's or Chili's? That, that's not going to happen. It's, your mind is hijacked. You need a visual so you can just like, ah, five, 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 <laughs> two, two, pizza, please. That's all because you, you don't have the time or the capacity to do much, else, you know. And the last thing to, to, um, to uh, I would say is anything that's going to help with self-care. If that means, um, if that means um, uh, you know, there, uh, some people do tapping, EFT. You know, it's tapping here or tapping here or tapping, you know, the EFT, the tapping. Some people um, find a gratitude journal helpful because when we go through betrayal trauma, we feel like we are hopeless. We are in a state of, um, helplessness, a state of dis despair. We're not thinking of gratitude. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the beautiful flowers around my house. Nobody's thinking about that. But but you got to force yourself to write down on paper, you know what? I'm breathing today. The sun came up. Uh, my, my brother called me to ask me how I am. Those were things I'm thankful for. So have a gratitude journal. Or, 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 or the other things, you know, some people need help breathing to prevent panic attacks. So I always say there's, you know, so many breathing techniques. There's a million of them. But some people, you know, br you know breathe in slowly through your nose while you're, while you're tracing your finger very slowly and then breathe out while you're going down and then and just do it. It takes about 15 seconds. Breathe in like you're smelling hot pizza. Blow out like you're blowing it out. Breathe in that beautiful chocolate chip cookie you just made in the oven. Blow it out. Cool it down so you can shove it in your mouth and, and eat your fingers away. So there's so many things to do. But those are three things that, you know, I would say you could start with. I think those those are amazing. I remember I was talking to, um, this was actually a business coach. And she said, you need to do more. You need to do three minutes out loud every day about gratitude. And I'm like, I'm thankful. You don't tell me what it is. <laughs> and she said, no, you're thinking I'm talking about, oh, I'm grateful. I'm speaking. Oh, you're grateful for your culture. She said, heck no. She said, I don't, I don't say that. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about then? She said, you, you get down and get dirty. She said, be thankful you have electricity because there's so many people without it. She said, be thankful you have a refrigerator because there are people that have to bury their food in the ground. And when she got done with the list, I was floored. And so though, that woke me up that I was not grateful for things that I don't think about. And that's what she was trying to show me. And she said, when you become grateful for the things you don't think about, then you will have better success in what you're trying to do to help other people. So for three minutes, it goes faster than I think. When I first started, I, I was like, I'm not going to get through it. But by day two, I was just beyond three minutes and I'm, I'm like I'm thankful I have blinds to cover my windows I'm thankful I have lights and all that kind of stuff and people may think that's stupid but we forget a lot of the world doesn't have running water we forget that we can lay in the bed and fall asleep to Netflix at night and they may have never even heard or seen it so she wasn't trying to say that westernized problems are less than she was saying learn to be grateful that you don't have the other problems. And so that's when I woke up. I'm like, yeah, I really am grateful that I don't have to deal with that. It's sad that other people do, but I better start being grateful that I'm not in those situations. So I think everything that you were just saying is amazing. And you got to put forth the effort. And I want to tell people I'm, I'm about, I don't really count. So I'm going to say I'm 16, 17 years in as losing my husband and son. If I wanted to really count, I could for those that want a specific date, 2006, there you go. I don't count it. Um, even though I was existing, I wasn't existing. Mm 
Yeah. Even though I wasn't still holding on to the toilet bowl, barfing my guts out, I would only last so long before I'd be in the car listening to a Beyonce and crying my eyes out or screaming to Beyonce because that she was making me feel whole and strong that day or I'd be okay for a while and then just without even realizing it, I just wasn't there. And what I mean by not there, you're just not there. You're there, but you're not there. Yeah. So if you guys think you're walking around and you're not dealing with the trauma and you're not dealing with the betrayal that comes with it because we all have a betrayal level that comes with our trauma, you're wrong. And so when I finally started tackling it, I was a lot farther behind than I thought. I thought, I'm working. I took care of my other kid. We're okay. And it was a lot that I was just flat out doing wrong for myself and for my child. So I hope people that are watching, and hey, guys, I see some more people have joined, um, understand that this trauma exists and it's very real. If you need that type of help, please call uh, or get on Mr. J's page and um, get some help with that. Um, I think having somebody help you dig it out is probably better than you trying to do it alone because I, I don't know if Mr. J will agree. If you try to do this alone, you may end up in the hospital. It's, it's, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, um, listen, it, it's just, if you break your leg, are you going to perform your own surgery? I mean, let's <laughs> So, so when your soul is broken, you know, it's probably not the wisest thing. Now, that's not to say if you have extreme faith and you trust God and, you know, absolutely. Um, but, uh, you know, one of, I'll tell you, one of the things that, that, um, that I had to tell myself at one point, I had to ask myself, Jay, do you love yourself? And I had to really think about that because, because everybody likes to put on the face, you know, Oh, I am all that I am. Of course I love my... Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get real and well, okay? Because here's the deal. If you're going to love yourself, then you can't hate all the things that made you who you are. <laughs> People have been through some crap. And I'm not saying to love that crap at all, but you can't continually hate wh wh what made you who you are if you love yourself. Yeah. And so I, I really had to say, you know what? Okay, I don't like what happened to me, but I appreciate the lessons. I don't like what happened to me and I don't love what happened to me, but I love myself. And, and so, and this is what I'm saying is that, you know, certainly people can, you know, there's books out there to do some self healing and there's, faith, oh, yeah. you know, there's this stuff. But there's, you know, the old, the old saying, you can put 90% of energy into something and get only 10%, you know, received productivity. Or if you are, have the proper tools and resources, you can put 10% of energy into something and get 90% of a return. So it just makes yeah. sense to go to somebody who, you know, has the tools so that you can get the, you know, most out of your percentage to deal with. But betrayal trauma is no joke. It is life changing. It is absolutely life changing. You are um, never the same. But if you heal properly, you can become a person who is 2.0. And that 2.0 person could be so much better than the person before your trauma. I think that's great. And we're going to start to wrap up. Um, I think everything you taught us today has been amazing. You know, betrayal trauma, betrayal blindness. A lot of times we just don't want to see what's in front of us, even though we may spend years like I did before I finally got the help I needed. And I want people to understand I have faith and I went and got help. Forget. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, you can only pray away so much. The reason we have what we have is because God gave us people that have the ability to counsel and help us. So for me, I went to groups. I went to a counselor. Um, I went to my church faith group as well about grief and dealing with things I haven't been dealing with. And so you have to find those little tribes to get yourself back together. It may not be just one person that can do it. If one person does it, I'm all for it. But you may have to find more than one source. So as we wrap up, do you have anything you'd like to share with our audience? Listen, I can talk until next Tuesday and not take a breath. But I'll just say this. <laughs> <laughs> In the history of mankind, womankind, humankind, 
nobody has ever died from a snake bite. Nobody has ever died from a snake bite. What people die from is the venom getting into your veins, going into your bloodstream, going up to your heart, stopping it. That's what makes, that's what kills you. So people like snakes are going to pain. They're going to give us pain. You cannot live this life without getting pain from people. However, it is our job to prevent that person's pain from being like venom and into our system and reaching our heart. They might have given us our pain. We're responsible for our suffering. So put yourself first and talk to somebody or do what you got to do to prevent that, that venom from going to your heart and completely killing you. Um, and I'm telling you something. There's people 30 years out of trauma that are having physical manifestations of ailments that just because that negative fireball that was you know, inside of them just never was dealt with. It will come out in one way or another.